If you have Irish friends, are planning on visiting Ireland, or just want insight into Irish humour, then there's really only one sitcom that's essential viewing, because there's no way to talk about Irish comedy without talking about Channel 4's Father Ted. Set on a small remote island off the west coast of Ireland and focused on the lives of three priests living in a parochial house, Father Ted's sharp-witted, silly, surrealistic and even slapstick humour encapsulates a certain essence of Irish culture. For outsiders, and especially modern audiences, sitcoms with laugh tracks are often dismissed as dated, forced and unrealistic. But for anyone that grew up in Ireland, Father Ted is guaranteed to ignite fits of laughter, for reasons that are hard to describe but I'll try my best. So let's take a deep dive into understanding Irish comedy through our most cherished sitcom, Father Ted. First you need to understand Ireland's complex relationship with the Catholic Church. Once considered the most Catholic country in the world, Ireland's cultural values have shifted in modern times. In 1984, nearly 90% of Irish Catholics attended Mass each week, but by 2011, that number plummeted to just 18%. Yet according to a 2016 census, 78% of Ireland still identifies as Catholic. So you might assume, even if they don't attend Mass, Ireland must be a very religious country. But then if you actually visited Ireland and talked to the people, you may come away thinking very different. You see, the Catholic Church used to rule Ireland with an iron fist, both culturally and systematically. Divorce wasn't made legal until 1997, and abortion was only legalised by popular vote in 2018. Meanwhile, over the last 20 years, more and more revelations keep being uncovered regarding how the Church's institutions had been both emotionally and physically abusing women and children for decades. So why do such a high number still identify as Catholic? Well, as recently as 2020, the Catholic Church still run over 88% of the schools in the country. You may not think that's a big deal, but it does add texture to that earlier number, that while 78% of Ireland may identify as Catholic, only 18% attend Mass. And that's because in order to attend most of these schools, you need to be a registered Catholic. Now, by now you might be thinking, I thought this video was meant to be about comedy, why are you telling me about these depressing historical details? Well, firstly, because Irish humour is quite dark, but also it's important to understand the coercive grip Catholicism had over the country, because from baptism to communion to confirmation and school, the church has a key role to play in the upbringing of almost every Irish citizen. So in 1995, you have a country filled with underlying resentment and mixed feelings about the Catholic Church that they can never really speak about, and yet still need to systematically feed into if they want their children to go to a good school. And then this unexpected sitcom pops onto our screens. Say if there's 200 million priests in the world and 5% and of them are paedophiles, that's still only 10 million. <laughs> Father Ted isn't a mean-spirited sitcom, but successfully identifies how funny the very idea of priesthood actually is. And despite how the priests are all meant to emanate a sense of calm understanding and spirituality, they're instead portrayed as deeply flawed individuals who just happen to be priests. They're no more moral or insightful than anyone else. Glory be to God, priests ahead of divorce referendum. Oh, come on, divorce referendum! Come on, divorce referendum! <laughs> There's Ted, the typical chancer who has a history of defrauding charities, even though he claims the money was just resting in his account. Dougal, possibly the most foolish and naive human being that has ever walked the earth. Jack, the disgusting elderly abusive priest who just drinks all day. And Mrs. Doyle, the overworked housekeeper that's expected to take care of them all, as they have absolutely no idea how to take care of themselves. Each character and performance is iconic in Ireland, all bringing a completely different comedy style to the table that blends together perfectly. Although Irish citizens may not fully understand their feelings toward the religion that raised them, there's undeniably something cathartic about watching the church get taken down a peg, and exposed as a mostly silly institution that still takes itself seriously. In physical reality, we have a bunch of strange men of various ages all forced to live together and repeat mass over and over. And given they're all celibate and don't have to survive in the real world, there's a boyish innocence to them that's just, well, funny. Writers Graham Linehan and Arthur Miller 
poke fun at the idea that although the characters' lives are dedicated to a belief in God, when there's a real emergency, they don't really rely on it or believe in it, and experience the same doubts about religion's inherent contradictions as anyone else. Should we not just have a bit of an old prey? I mean, maybe God will help us and... <laughs> and although the local priests have to share bedrooms and live a financially humble existence, the bishops and cardinals are always portrayed as living the high life in gold palaces, constantly partying and enjoying the fruits of everyone else's labour. But it's not just a commentary of what's going on inside the church, it's about the Irish people's relationship with the role the priest is supposed to play in the community. When we look at John and Mary, an abusive couple who always fight behind the scenes but immediately put on a happy face whenever the priests are present, you might think, why don't they just separate if they hate each other so much? But given divorce wasn't legal when the show began, it's hard not to see this as a commentary on the church's control of our everyday lives. The parishioners want to be seen as good people, and as celibates, the priests are mostly oblivious and so enamoured by the idea of a happily married couple that they don't look beyond the surface. But aside from the social commentary on the church, Father Ted is poking fun at Irish culture itself, from our fixation with alcohol to our social etiquette to our singers and their unusual fan bases. Although socially Ireland has made huge progress over the last 30 years, there are still remnants of old Ireland that remain embedded in our culture. Throughout the series, there's a relatable humbleness to Irish settings that never quite match its ambitions. Nothing is ever fancy or glamorous, events are regularly held outdoors in a field, or if they're indoors, despite the epic show they're trying to put on, it's always a bit small, cheap and embarrassing. The show captures little Irishisms, things that are part and parcel of living in Ireland without even realising it. Such as incomprehensible rural accents, the heavy focus on hosting guests and insisting they have something to eat or drink, how boring it can then be to sit down with those guests and struggle to make conversation, as there's only so much you can say before you start repeating yourself. How in small island life, news and gossip is impossible to control, as there's so little happening in some areas that juicy information is more valuable than gold. But it's even the sound of gossip. Irish gossip has a different sound to it. Terrible. What's the world coming to? There are always elements of shame involved. We can't just be seen to enjoy gossiping, so the gossip tends to masquerade as a sort of public safety announcement, exaggerating the fears and dangers of the modern world to justify talking behind people's backs. You know what happened to old Mr. Sweeney. Some young fellas broke into his house. God, poor Mr. Sweeney, he wouldn't like that at all. And therefore it's important to be seen as good company, so we see overly exaggerated politeness that can turn sour once one person insists on paying the bill. It's these little insider details that makes the comedy resonate so strongly. For example, Irish people know all about the Eurovision Song Contest, because historically Ireland used to always perform abnormally well for such a small country, with 7 victories and 18 top 5 wins back in the day. Names like Dana and Johnny Logan, which probably mean very little to anyone outside the country, are taught to us from an early age. But when Ted and Dougal enter their atrocious lovely horse song, it still wins because Ireland wants to lose because it can't afford to host the contest for yet another year. Like a train in the night, like a train in the... Hold on, I can get this. Night! There are many reasons Father Ted is Ireland's favourite sitcom, but I think a large factor is the sheer number of laughs per episode. Nothing is wasted, almost every line is a gag, or leading into a larger joke. Sometimes just a character's shocked or offended expression is a joke in itself. Other times, characters have catchphrases or tendencies that reliably make us laugh because of how inappropriate they are. Like when Father Jack loses his glasses and accidentally walks into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and just saying his catchphrase, drink, over and over, resonates as a form of storytelling to the group. This may seem like simple comedy, but putting all the pieces of the puzzle in place to pull off the gag isn't easy, and in some respects takes years of audience investment to really land, as the jokes always have to naturally come from the characters. 
other times the gags are more physical and incorporate a degree of absurdism. For instance, one of my favourite moments is when Ted receives a car to give away at the local raffle, and when Dougal points out a tiny bump in the bonnet, Ted tries to fix it by gently tapping the other side with a hammer, and then has to balance out that last dent with another dent. We then fade to later and reveal his work. It's no use, Ted. You'll never get it absolutely right. <laughs> or when the three priests try to give up cigarettes, alcohol and rollerblading for Lent. First of all, the very idea that Dougal struggles to give up rollerblading as an adult, while the other two are quitting genuinely addictive substances, is hilarious in and of itself. But after a mere five minutes, we fade to them all breaking out in sweats as the addiction takes hold. They then hallucinate. Ted imagines a giant cigarette talking back to him. Jack imagines a giant pint. And Dougal imagines a giant rollerplate. <laughs> the sheer silliness of it all makes it impossible to not crack a smile, if not break into a deep belly laugh. The series brilliantly plays with movie references from time to time taking itself overly seriously in undeniably ludicrous situations. Like when eight priests get lost in the lingerie section of a shopping centre, and to avoid a national scandal, they all have to sneak out under the radar. So for this sequence, the show adopts the tone of a war movie, with the priests acting like soldiers trying to escape from behind enemy lines, and the very sight of a female shopper is the equivalent of an armed guard. Generally, the humour stems from placing priests in ridiculous situations that are optically terrible, as they're always meant to maintain a clean public image. But it's also about showcasing how these flawed characters struggle to perform their basic roles properly, like gossiping to one another about what they were told in confession, or not even listening to one another's problems. For example, when Father Kevin is so depressed that he has to be talked down from a ledge, he tries to confide in Ted about his dark thoughts and feelings, but Ted secretly just received great news about an exciting job offer in America. So while Kevin is finally opening up, something Irish people instinctively find hard to do, Ted is persistently dancing to the theme music from Shaft. It just makes me despair! Shaft! The juxtaposition of Kevin's depression with Ted's celebration is funny enough on its own but the writers decide to make the music turn Kevin's mood around, and he leaves the house ready to take on the world. But then when he gets on a bus, everything changes when Radiohead comes on the radio, and we get to watch Kevin gradually crumble back into the depths of depression. Now an American sitcom would probably just let Kevin leave in a great mood, because their audiences tend to like a happy ending. But this is Ireland. So instead, now that they've set up the idea that music can radically change a character's perception of reality, the funniest choice isn't to let him go away happy, it's to pay off that premise by having a tragic song drag him back down, to demonstrate how short-lived this musical solution would be in reality. It's a bleak, dark twist, but that is Irish humour. The joke is that we all know depression doesn't go away that easy. In our culture, it's cathartic to laugh at the things that can hurt us. It makes them less scary. But Father Ted isn't just funny because of its gags, or the fact that it preaches to the choir about Irish culture. The story writing is sharp and intelligent too, due to its social commentary and thematic continuity. If we look at The Passion of St. Tibulus, Ted and Dougal are ordered to protest a new blasphemous movie at the local theatre. Down with this sort of thing! Careful now. Down with this sort of the protest itself is hilarious, because it's so half-hearted. Their message is standardly generic and vague, but by drumming up such controversy, they accidentally promote the movie more, and it becomes the most successful film ever shown on the island. A clear commentary on how the church's attempts to repress certain ideas, instincts, and messages only makes them more tempting. Or when Ted secretly wants to go for a drink with a female writer, we see that he holds her in high regard for her work, the same way the visiting nuns hold him in high regard for how he performs mass, going as far as to ask him where he gets his ideas, like they're talking to a rock star. They've travelled all this way just to see him in action, but because Ted already has his secret date planned, he now has to let them down and rush through his mass in under 10 seconds, racing straight to the writer's home where he discovers that the nuns and Dougal are already there, as this was never intended as a date. The thematic continuity concludes with an ironic twist, 
After Ted lets down his fans because he was being tempted out of the church, the writer lets him down by being tempted into it, as she now wants to become a nun. Or when Ted is asked to host a lovely girls competition, the local equivalent of Miss Universe. The silliness of the tasks the contestants are made perform, like walking between cones like dogs at a dog show, making sandwiches that are just the right length, and comparing who subjectively has the nicest laugh, comments on the church's sexist views on women. While a radical feminist Sinead O'Connor style musician visits the island and is then shocked to see how Ted and the priests overwork Mrs. Doyle. The episodes always take the piss out of all the characters involved, so it never feels like a self-righteous lecture, while still taking the appropriate jabs at the way the church has structured the country to be. If you've never seen Ireland's favourite sitcom, it's essential viewing, featuring lots of laugh-out-loud moments and boasting some of Ireland's best comedic talent. Irish culture is all about being able to laugh at yourself, and after hundreds of years of existing under the thumb of the Catholic Church, the public finally got to express some of the feelings they'd been forced to bottle up inside, turning what was once a powerful and esteemed institution into a silly cast of characters for us to laugh at and embrace. We used to be forced to quote scripture, but now we can just endlessly quote the sitcom that mocks the very idea of it. And that's why Father Ted has permanently earned its place deep inside every Irish person's heart. Because really, what could be more Irish than turning your trauma into a cathartic joke? If you enjoy content like this and want to see more of it, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, as it really does make a difference to how much content I can pump out. Or if you can't afford that, then simply like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment down below to help the algorithm do its thing.